up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's lots of exciting news to go over here this week. And if you missed it, I already did a video on the brand new electric Dodge Charger Daytona SRT concept. So I'll link that above, you can go watch that. And it'll also be at the end of this video uh, in the playlist. You can uh, have that autoplay if you wanna watch it. But um, it's wild, definitely check out that video for sure. But moving on to the other stuff this week, there's lots more Dodge news and lots of other exciting new cars that debuted this week. And also one sad uh, vehicle that has died off as well so stay tuned for all that here in this video so first off porsche has revealed the 992 version of the 911 gt3 rs and so this is the 2023 model year vehicle and it still runs the wonderful four liter nationally aspirated flat six but it now does 518 horsepower 346 pound feet of torque while running through an improved seven speed pdk gearbox and uh, even though it doesn't sound like much power porsche claims a three second zero to 60 time and equally impressive is the new drag reduction system the car uses, which is similar to the systems you see in Formula One cars. So it has a flap in the front and adjustable pieces on the rear wing that can accentuate as needed to improve the aerodynamics and downforce, as well as even being used as air brakes. You can see that spoiler is massive in the back as well to give you lots more downforce and all the other little bits and pieces all over the vehicle, including those really cool hood vents there. Just very exciting looking and, you know, all very functional, of course, as well. Uh, speaking of the brakes, though, it gets slightly larger front brakes and the same rear brakes brakes as a regular GT3, uh, but there's of course carbon ceramics that are available as well, and those have also been made larger. The Wysage package is back uh, and makes a return here for 2023 with forged magnesium wheels that get rid of 18 pounds of unsprung weight. Plus there's more carbon fiber in that package for sure, and it has, you know, a more, uh, you know, race ready interior and all that. Also, the weight uh, is pretty low thanks to lots of carbon fiber reinforced plastic. That means the curb weight is only 3,268 pounds for the GT3. 3RS. And so prices will be starting at $225,250, which is about 20% more expensive than the last one. And that's even assuming you can get it at MSRP. Um, but, you know, since buyers probably don't care what these things cost anyway, it's really smart of Porsche to jack up the prices and, you know, get every ounce of profit out of it they can themselves instead of just letting all the flippers and dealers take all the extra profit instead. So, um, you know, I think that's really great. And <laughs> it's going to be starting to arrive here in the spring of 2023. Another crazy vehicle before I get to some more relatable stuff here this week. Aston Martin has revealed the first of three debuts for Pebble Beach this weekend. And so this one's the DBR22. It's inspired by the DBR1, uh, you know, car from way back when. It has a completely unique body and interior. And there's no info on what platform it's based on, but my guess would be the Vantage platform, just like the last Speedster that Aston Martin did. You know, it seems to be very similar as far as uh, dimensions and stuff goes. So that's my bet. And this one also does run the 5.2 liter twin turbo V12 as well, just like that Speedster. And in this application, it has 705 horsepower and 555 pound-feet of torque, along with a 3.4 seconds zero to 60. One other cool touch is that the rear subframe uh, has been made with 3D printed aluminum parts that were then bonded together. And they say this makes it lighter and more rigid, uh, and they say it previews a future production technique they plan to use in regular production vehicles as well. So pretty cool about that. Aston claims it's also technically a prototype, um, but they'll be building probably a couple dozen of these and they'll all be you know several million dollars each, like they always are. But still, I think this is a gorgeous looking car. Super, super cool and uh, so awesome to see that. But for some more relatable car news here, Dodge this week has revealed the Hornet for 2023. So as you might be able to tell, it's heavily based on the Alfa Romeo Tonale, um, just with unique styling inside and out, and a few small mechanical changes as well though. So aside from you know, the new bumpers and the lights, the biggest change you can probably see is the vented hood there to make it look more muscular. Uh, the cool Hornet badges on the fenders are a nice touch as well though. And then on the inside, it gets, you know, again, styling that's very, very similar to the Alfa, but does get a unique dash and air vent design and the start button's been moved from the steering wheel to the center console. You also get unique upholstery, and of course there's unique graphics for the screens, which are 12.3 inches for the gauges and 10.25 inches for the touchscreen. Uh, and surprisingly, the Hornet does get more power than the uh, more premium Tonale, which is uh, shocking, because I don't know if we have pricing for Tonale just yet, but this is going to be cheaper, and yet it's more powerful, so that's pretty wild. So anyway, for the Hornet here, the base version is the GT trim, and that gets 268 horsepower and 295 pound-feet of torque from the two liter turbo four um, which is 12 more than the alpha gets it runs through a nine speed automatic it has all wheel drive as standard and we'll be doing a six and a half seconds zero to 60 
which is really, you know, stout for a vehicle that's uh, going to be fairly dynamic for, I mean, what it is for the price point there. Because they say it's the quickest, fastest, and most powerful crossover under $30,000, which is the starting price. Uh, it's $29,995. But, you know, six and a half seconds there to 60 crossover for under thirty grand. That's not bad. I mean, you know, it's probably fairly stripped down for that base model, but it seems like it has, you know, a decent amount of standard equipment and stuff. You have all the drive is standard, all that kind of stuff, which in past Dodge products, you know, the, all those kind of things have been optional add-ons to have turbo power, to have, you know, the all-wheel drive and stuff. So, I mean, I think it's good value under 30 grand there, honestly. Uh, the faster one is the RT trim, um, which goes down to a 1.3 liter turbo four, but adds in a plug-in hybrid electric setup with the electric motors front and rear. And that setup does 288 horsepower, which is 16 more than the same setup in the Tenale, um, and 383 pound-feet of torque, which is a really, uh, you know, good amount there, almost 400 pound feet of torque in this little thing. Um, it also is the first production application of Dodge's PowerShot launch control that puts the engine into an overboost mode for 15 seconds for 25 more horsepower. Uh, but surprisingly, even with all the extra power, it's only 0.4 second faster for the zero to 60 time um, than the base model at 6.1 seconds. Part of that might be because the gas part of this uh, powertrain runs through a six speed automatic versus the nine speed in the turbo four. Uh, but still the instant zap of the electric motors and stuff, I would have thought this would have been quicker but they don't say how many miles the of ev range it'll do but they do say it runs a 15.5 kilowatt hour battery and um the rt also gets four piston brembo brakes in the front and still gets brembos even in the rear i believe they're you know single piston but still nice to have brembos all around it's something not all vehicles do the brakes and the metal paddle shifters are both available as options on the gt as well if you want to you know upgrade your gt uh, the rt also gives you a dual exhaust and then suspension wise they all come with coney shocks with adaptive dampers being optional and it uses McPherson struts up front and a three-link independent rear, along with an electronic limited slip differentials that actually does torque vectoring. So I'm mean, having a limited slip diff again in a vehicle uh, that you know is 30 grand. It's you know still again solid for what this is. You know a compact crossover. I think it's pretty pretty good. I think it's actually technically probably a subcompact crossover. But anyway, I mean if it handles like an Alpha 2, I mean those are good bones from a dynamic standpoint. Alfa Romeo knows how to engineer a good handling vehicle. I've always loved the handling of the Stelvia the Julia was amazing they are really impressive to drive so I'm expecting you know the Tenali to be fairly good for what it is and again in the context of subcompact crossovers with everyone else going for rugged like let's go off-roading it's really refreshing to have a street focused crossover here uh, that has good solid performance I know, you know people might be upset about the styling or the fact that it shares a platform with another vehicle um, or the Hornet name or whatever, but I think this thing's actually cool. It's really, I think I'm, I'm just excited to see Dodge offering something that isn't a Challenger Charger or Durango. You know, they used to have the Dart and have various other models and then that all evaporated. And so it's really nice to see Dodge again offering a few more uh, models here. And so that's uh, great. And um, if you want to take it even further, they showed off a GLH package, which stands for Goes Like Hell and that uh, harkens back to the old Dodge Omni from the 1980s and the Go Like Hell version was actually the uh, Carroll Shelby version that he uh, hopped up a little bit. And so that is added onto the GT trim for this concept here and gives you a suspension that's lowered by over an inch plus a catback exhaust, 20 inch wheels, painted black cladding and graphics. Uh, but it is just a concept and it's intended to show what accessories you can add. So I'm not sure if they'll actually sell a GLH package. I doubt they will be cool if they did though honestly that's not a thing people are like oh how could you use you know carol shelby's name here on this thing and it's like the glh was on a dodge omni i mean it was like you know a cheap little econa box nothing exciting nothing special and you know it's not like it's some revered name the glh name so i think totally throw it on the hornet here for you know sportier version I don't think, you know, with all the other sacrilege going off names these days, uh, the GLH name is not one that I'm upset about seeing again. So also you can add extra power on, and that's one of the things we're using with this GLH package is to advertise how there's this uh, direct connection package that Dodge has where they have different stage kits. So you can bump the tune and all that under, uh, you know, a factory style warranty for your Hornet if you want more power than even that. So kind of going into, you know, the customization thing here, which has been very successful for all the other Dodge products, you know, it totally makes sense. And so, like I mentioned, it'll be starting at $29,995 for the GT before destination, and the RT will be starting $10,000 more at $39,995. Now, that one seems like a tough sell, considering, you know, it's 
barely any faster in a straight line, at least as far as 0 to 60 goes. You know, you have some other nice goodies there. You know, it sounds like that's the one that gets the Brembos. And obviously, if you tack some extra stuff onto a GT, it'll also probably be almost 40 grand. So, you know, we'll have to see about that. But, um, you know, I think the GTs are a solid value if you take it easy on options. You know, get one of those for low 30s. I think it's a fun little, you know, crossover. We'll have to see how it is space wise and stuff. I'm excited to hopefully test one out at some point here, um, as well as the Tenali. I'm hoping to try out at some point. But anyway, I think these are cool. I know some people were giving them grief online for, you know, coming out with this Hornet, but I just think Dodge needs to offer more stuff. This is how a car company survives, not by making only sports cars and muscle cars. You got to make people movers, and I think this is a pretty nice people mover for what it is, and, uh, you know, a little bit of extra fun flair with the Dodge stuff. So, Anyway, if you're interested in one of these, uh, the GT will be arriving first with ordering open now and the first delivery is happening in December. The RT will arrive next spring and it's interesting to see that. But getting back to the Challenger, Charger, and Durango, speaking of those, Dodge revealed some cool stuff for all three during their speed week this week. So. First, the Challenger and the Charger. Uh, Dodge announced this week that both are coming to an end in their current form. That's a very important little line here instead of, you know, all the clickbaity titles and, you know, articles being like, oh, the Challenger and Charger are going away in their current form. Obviously, we already saw the electric Charger and the Charger is now a two door with that new electric concept. Again, that's just a concept. Chances are that will be what they end up doing for production. I mean, it makes sense to call an electric car a charger. And that also gets back to the actual you know, origin of the charger. Everyone was mad back in 2008 whenever they made the charger a four-door. Now everyone loves it. It's so funny how that happens. But uh, so now they're going back to being a two-door with a charger. Now people are also mad once again that it's not a four-door anymore. I think there will be a coupe and a four-door version of that electric charger. Um, as far as the Challenger's fate, we'll have to see, you know, what they end up doing with the Challenger here. Um, that's the only thing that's up in the air. But again, the fact that it says in their current form makes me think we will, of course, see a new Challenger. It's too successful to not continue, I think. I'm just not sure what they'll do if they have, you know, a coupe Charger as well, unless the Challenger is the one that stays with gas, possibly, and Charger goes electric and they kind of diverge. Um, and that just means people that want a gas-powered Dodge muscle vehicle will be out of luck if you want four doors, but they'll at least keep the Challenger around. We'll have to see about all that. But that's my hunch currently. Anyway, so a little tangent there, but yeah, in their current form, they are going away. Um, but before they go, they're going out in style here. So Dodge has worked out a deal with Drop Top Customs to offer a convertible Challenger finally. After so many years of people begging for it and Dodge never offering it from the factory, they still aren't offering it from the factory, but they worked out an agreement here so that you're able to get one. So it's still aftermarket, but basically it's coordinated with your dealer so that you place an order for a convertible one. It's shipped from the factory as a coupe so for safety and emissions and all that kind of stuff, they don't have to recertify because it's a coupe as far as it left the factory, but then it gets shipped straight to Drop Top Customs. They hack it apart and uh, make it a convertible. It's aftermarket, so therefore it skirts all the regulations and stuff. And then you have your convertible Challenger and it's delivered straight to the dealer. So it's still, you know, a very polished process and everything. And this company apparently has been in business for a long time and does, you know, quality conversions, obviously, for Dodge to be working with them. And so it's not going to come cheap though if you want it. It's going to be $26,000 extra for this convertible version if you want it. So uh, that means, and it only is available on RT and Ops. So that means if you want one, you're basically looking at, I think it's around $66,000 or so for a base Challenger convertible here. Again, you get the V8 still with the RT and stuff. So it's not a base V6, but still 66 grand for uh, a Challenger to start here. And you can have it all the way up to red eye and wide body red eyes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so. You can have one probably six figures if you want. And so that's cool they do that, though. They say that um, they add chassis reinforcements and it has a power folding top that has an insulation in it and even has a glass rear window. And then moving on to the other actual factory enhancements uh, for the final 2023 model year here, the Charger and Challenger will get seven new special editions. Um, so, you know, we'll see what they do with them. But, I mean, they're really milking this thing. I mean, every single special edition possible. Seven in one model year. Um, and they'll be revealed over the next few months here with the final one being revealed at SEMA this fall. And so uh, even regular Challengers and Chargers here for 2023 will be getting last call plaques um, under the hood. And four old colors are returning as well. B5 Blue, Plum Crazy, Sublime, and Destroyer Gray. The RTs will also get 345 badges on the Fenders, um, which is kind of a cool Retro uh, touch, and uh, they'll both be built until December of 2023 as well. So they're taking that entire model year, the entire calendar year, and they're going to build every last one they can. And then, most likely in 2024, 
I guess, you know, right around, you know, the beginning of the year there, you'll start to see them churning out the electric charger most likely once we see a production version of that. That hasn't been confirmed, but that, you know, is the intelligent guess here is that they'll continue to build something at that factory um, unless they switch over to the new Challenger at that point as well. That's possible too. But um, so, yeah, and, uh, you know, because there's going to be so many and they're going to be building them until the end of December, that means that, you know, you'll be able to grab a Challenger charger in their current form well into 2024, you know, as far as dealer stock goes and stuff, unless people, you know, rush out and buy them like it's a Black Friday sale or something. But aside from that, there will be challenges and chargers around for probably the next two years still to buy new. Um, so you don't have to run out panicking right now. But, you know, if you want to get an order in for a new one, you know, I would recommend doing it sooner rather than later. And, um, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, it's definitely sad to see it go. Obviously, I will do save my whole eulogy until the end of 2023 for this vehicle. But, you know, it's uh, it's the new Charger, the electric thing is going to be very exciting. It's going to be fun and exciting in a new and different way, you know, and that's, you know, it will be fun. I'm, I totally have no doubts it's going to be amazing, but, you know, it's not going to have the roar of a V8, the whine of a supercharger, um, you know, just that, that raw sensation, the smells, you know, all those things will still be missing. Even if the, this new one does have an exhaust and has sounds and stuff, it's not going to be the same. I know some people just want the same. They don't want change. And, you know, it is going to be sad to see them go. They're incredible vehicles. I've been truly felt honored and, you know, just special to be able to go on these launches and be able to, you know, be on the media, you know, press events for these Hellcats and stuff. They are incredible, super fun vehicles. I wouldn't mind owning one someday myself. They are so, so fun. And, um... But yeah, it's uh, their time is drawing to a close here, and I'm um, just excited to see you know what we have here in the future. But at least you know they built them for a long time. You know, several. I mean, what is it probably at this point? Eight years they were building uh, Hellcats for. So uh, yeah, close to eight years. I mean, it's it's been a good long run here. So you know, at least there's tons of them out there. You know, they'll be very plentiful on the used market for decades to come. And, uh, you know, everyone can still enjoy them, you know, in the future. So anyway, but uh, cool to hear about all these, you know, final hurrah things from Dodge. The last bit of Dodge news here is about the Durango. The great news that the, is that the Hellcat Durango is actually returning for the 2023 model year. It died off in 2021. They said it had to be a limited production thing. They only were selling like a few hundred several hundred of them i think because of emissions problems they weren't able to bring it into the 2022 model year i guess those problems are resolved because now they're back here with uh, the, the vehicle here for 2023 so and after living with one for a week i had you know hellcat durango for a week uh last year it's an incredible vehicle highly recommend it um you know if you can get into one of these things it's an amazing daily driver um so uh dodge just said they brought it back though also because people kept asking to buy them which, I mean, they could have assumed that, you know, I mean, that doesn't take a smart person to figure out that people, you know, wanted them to keep building these. So, um, but I'm glad that you brought it back. That's awesome. And um, so, you know, as far as the future of this vehicle, you know, again, the Hellcat at motor, maybe it will stick around a little bit longer, you know, the TRX and stuff, because you don't have to worry about the emission stuff as much for those trucks. But for the Durango, you know, it still might be a tough sell beyond 2023. So I wouldn't count on this lasting much longer than this model year coming up. Um, they didn't say how many they're building either, how long they're building them for. So, you know, if you missed out on your chance last time, definitely don't wait around this time and, you know, quickly get one in here, you know, before uh, they are probably gone again, you know, relatively soon. So anyway, but very exciting to hear that uh, for the Durango. Moving on from uh, Dodge stuff, Chevy this week has revealed a Bison version of the Silverado ZR2. It gets a new grille, steel bumpers, with the front one there being able to accommodate a winch. There's four steel skid plates for the diffs, transfer case, and fuel tank, plus steel sliders on the sides. It gets a two-tone tailgate and unique wheels with 33-inch tires. It'll be available with either the 6.2-liter V8 or a revised version of the 3-liter Duramax diesel. And that diesel is available also in several other 2023 Silverado trims and it's uh, going to be going from 277 horsepower to 305 horsepower now, and torque rises from 460 pound-feet to 495 pound-feet. The increases come thanks to new pistons, and fuel injectors, a retuned turbo, and a couple other small changes. And production starts next year. Um, it's going to be starting at $78,490 which is $8,295 more than a regular ZR2 Silverado. And also right around the same starting price as a Ram TRX and the F-150 Raptor. Now the Raptor's rumored to get a price increase here um, for this new model year. We'll see about that. But regardless, I mean, it's very close to the pricing 
of stuff that has way more power, way more off-road capability, and the Ram having 700 horsepower, you know, it's just... I don't know. Um, I think you kind of really have to be a Chevy diehard person to want to run out and buy one of these Bisons, honestly. You know, I mean, it's just, I don't know. I just, I feel like you get more power and more capability from everybody else. You know, it's just, it just, I don't know. I don't, I don't really understand this vehicle, honestly. I don't know why Chevy doesn't put the awesome supercharged V8 that they have laying all around and they just put it in the Escalade V. Why they can't put that motor in a Silverado, um, you know, and, yeah, I don't know, but I guess this shows that if they did put that motor in a Silverado, it'd be easily a hundred grand truck, uh, much like the Raptor, I guess, with the Raptor R, um, because there is no way, uh, you know, if the Bison is already, you know, almost eighty grand, you know, you actually put that good motor in this thing and actually beef up everything else so it competes with the Raptor and the T-Rex, and yeah, you're looking at a six-figure truck. So man, that Ram T-Rex continues to look like a better and better value every day, in my opinion, and it's you know eighty thousand dollars starting price roughly. Um, but anyway, um, yeah. So interesting to see that uh, Zero Two Bison. And BMW has teased a new electric M powertrain here that they're teasing and uh, testing out here. So um, it's a hacked up i4 that you're seeing here with an M3 front end and wider uh, fender flares. So don't expect this actual thing to come to production, but the powertrain will show up eventually and it sounds pretty wild. So it has four motors, one for each wheel, and BMW says this allows precise, variable, and quick torque distribution. And it'll likely end up, I'm guessing, in an electric M5 first. That's you know, I think the safe bet, uh, but Autocar is reporting that BMW is also reconsidering the idea of a f uh, electric supercar, um, some type of new M1, kind of like the Vision M uh, concept uh, that they, you know, came out with not too long ago. And so BMW's M, uh, th their CEO, told Autocar, as car guys, we are always dreaming of making such cars. It doesn't mean we'll make them, but we keep exploring those ideas. And then he added, I'm always trying to figure out how it would work. So best of luck to him. I hope they can find a way to justify, you know, doing an M electric supercar. I think that would be super cool. Um, but in the meantime, it sounds like, you know, this powertrain is a safe bet in the M5 and, um, you know, could come out in other stuff like an M6 coupe or something or an M8, I guess, coupe, uh, you know, something like that. But it sounds, you know, very, very promising there. And uh, hopefully they can do some type of supercar. I mean, you know, everyone else coming out with these insanely expensive, you know, vehicles. I don't know why BMW doesn't just, you know, charge a million dollars for them and, you know, do, uh, you know, a few of them and use the same powertrain. It should be fairly easy if it's electric too, you know, to swap it over. We'll see. But anyway, interesting to hear all that. Getting back to Pebble Beach here. Um, Hennessy has pulled the wraps off the Venom F5 Roadster. Um, speaking of crazy uh, priced vehicles. So Hennessy claims it'll be the fastest and most powerful Roadster in the world with its 1,817 horsepower and its top speed claim still being over 300 miles per hour, uh, but only when the roof is on. When it's off, it'll be lowered. Uh, but that, that'd be pretty wild. I don't know how much you know, this thing would top out at with the roof off, but uh, you know, if you can even get close to 300 with the top down, that would be a pretty wild experience. Anyway, aside from the removal roof panel, it gets unique wheels and a higher price tag of $3 million versus the $2.1 million for the coupe. So, I mean, you're almost a million dollars surcharge for having a little carbon fiber panel that pops off the top there uh essentially that's what you're paying almost a million dollars for uh, and uh also they're building six more of these in the coupe so it's less rare than the coupe they're do doing 30 of them total so it seems like an uphill battle for that one especially since they haven't proven the 300 mile per hour speed yet i think they got up to 271 so far and so right now bugatti still holds the record there for that and even the sec to atara i think is you know right up around there as well so um you know i think hennessy has their work cut out for them here, but best of luck to them. Another crazy powerful car coming to Pebble Beach is a new faster version of the Lucid Air. So um, this one's going to have a three motor setup that they've been teasing here on Twitter. And so the Dream Edition already did 1,111 horsepower. So this should be even more than that, which I mean, it's already bonkers. Um, and their CEO in the past did even say that the, the new rear motors are so powerful, just the two back motors are so powerful, they could do 1,300 horsepower on their own. So then you add on, you know, one of these other motors in the front, you could be potentially doing 2,000 horsepower um, with three motors. Now, I don't know if it'll do the 2,000 either now or later or ever, but apparently that's the potential. So, you know, anything's possible, but I mean, just wild. Anything over 1,000 horsepower is already wild enough. And then, you know, it'd be, you know, almost 2,000 would be insane. So, 
Very interesting to see that. We'll see you know, what ends up happening this weekend with that reveal. Acura has revealed their uh, Precision EV concept at Pebble Beach, and while they do say it'll preview the design language for a future electric SUV, um, they say this doesn't exactly preview any one particular future vehicle. So basically, you know, don't ex don't expect this to be, you know, exactly what we'll be getting as far as an electric Acura SUV, but, you know, it's safe to assume it'll be something similar to this, at least as far as the front end goes. And regardless, though, I think it looks really impressive. I mean, that nose is very dramatic. It has a very nautical uh, look to it there, and they say that was inspired by luxury Italian power boats. The light-up grille is also really cool, and the particle glitch lower lighting there is an interesting touch as well, but that's what they call it there. Um, we'll see how people react to that, because I feel like it kind of looks like they're not all lit up or something, you know, but uh, I think it's very unique and, you know, it'd be interesting to see how that plays out in a production vehicle. The headlights and taillights look great in typical Acura fashion as well. And the interior is a lot less realistic, but Acura does say that it does preview a new infotainment system. So that screen you're seeing there um, is curved and uh, is thankfully a touch screen. No controller, uh, you know, pad to be found anywhere. So thankfully it sounds like Acura has been hearing the complaints and has decided to go with everyone else aside from Mazda and just ditch the controller wheels and just use a touchscreen. I'm very happy to see that. Obviously this is a little ways off and this is again only previewing this electric thing so don't expect touchscreens and any of the other Acuras until next generations of all of them. They're all fairly fresh so you know I think it's going to be a little bit of a while before we see any of this kind of stuff show up anything else. I guess the first thing could potentially be the RDX, but that just came out, I believe, for the 2019 model year. So you still probably got about three three more years to go on the RDX before even that would get this screen. Um, so if you want this screen first, you'll have to go for the electric thing coming out, I believe, in 2024. But anyway... Very exciting to see, you know, they're going to have a touchscreen here in Acura's finally. Another interior preview that we got uh, this week was from Mercedes for the upcoming EQE SUV. And so, in typical Mercedes fashion, it looks identical to the EQE sedan, the EQS SUV, um, complete with the optional hyperscreen here you see, plus there's plenty of leather and metal. And um, it is beautiful still, though, even if it isn't unique. I mean, it's a gorgeous looking interior. I just, it's like they all blend together anymore. I don't even know what I'm looking at. You know, it's so hard to distinguish any of them anymore because they're all looking the same on the outside, looking the same on the inside in a lot of ways. Um, but anyway, one other interesting note here is that Mercedes told Autoblog that this hyperscreen won't be available in the U.S. Uh, for the 2023 model year um, for the EQE SUV. Um, so I'm not sure why we're not getting the hyperscreen in that since we'll get the hyperscreen and everything else. But um, we'll have to make do with the 12.8-inch touchscreen instead at least to start here. Uh, the rest of the vehicle will be unveiled in October, on October 16th, but you don't need very much imagination to figure out what this is going to look like. You know, I mean, based on everything else Mercedes has done, basically expected to be the EQS SUV, just shrunken down a little. And, you know, the slight tweaks you have there on the front end for the EQE, you'll probably see translate here for the SUV version as well. And uh, so anyway, you know, but very cool to get that little bit of a preview. Another electric SUV that was partially revealed unofficially is the new Volvo flagship electric SUV. So World Scoop Forum found these patent images on the EU Intellectual Property Office website, and then they show off this new SUV that looks like an electric evolution of the XC90. And so Motor One also found a trademark application on the same EU site uh, for the name EXC90. So it's kind of surprising though, considering Volvo's former CEO did say they're going to be going to real names for future Volvos. This clearly is not a real name and just adds even another letter to the alphabet soup name, but we'll have to see what ends up happening with all that. You know, the mystery is still out there for that. But the images show off, you know, the dashboard and steering wheel here as well, um, which look really nice. Uh, but it's surprising though, there looks like they're gonna be sticking to a smaller uh, touchscreen there. It's still vertical, like, you know, the stuff they've been using for the past, you know, handful of years already. But um, I guess they're sticking with a smaller screen, which is definitely different than the rest of the industry these days. But, um, you know, it could work. We'll have to wait and see. And so Volvo's current CEO said the fourth quarter of this year is when we, they will be releasing more details about this new vehicle. They didn't say a full-blown reveal. I would assume it's a reveal. We'll have to wait and see. But interesting to hear that nonetheless. And some other Volvo-related news. Polestar has announced this week um, that the O2 concept that we saw just a few months back will be put into production as the Polestar 6 and that reservations are now open 
open for it, but it won't be arriving until 2026. But it's just exciting that, you know, they were able to greenlit this thing and, you know, actually approve it for production. And uh, even though it's not coming till 2026, 2026, it still might end up arriving before the Tesla Roadster, uh, you know, the way they're going with that. Um, and also it could be the first modern electric convertible uh, since the first uh, Tesla Roadster, unless Mini beats them to the punch. You know, Mini just teased out um, a one-off electric Cooper SE, so maybe for the next generation Cooper, if that comes in, you know, they have an electric version of that before 2026, that could be the first. Otherwise, I um, mean, you know, this could actually be the first year. We'll have to see. And maybe Tesla will actually finally put the uh, Roadster out at some point as well. We'll see. But anyway, um, hopefully it'll be worth the wait, you know. And uh, whenever this does arrive in 2026, uh, Polestar says it'll do 884 horsepower, 664 pound feet of torque, and a 3.2 second zero to 60 time as well. Um, so. I hope the styling, you know, stays very close to the concept because it is beautiful looking. And they did say for the first few people that register or, you know, for their reservations, they will be getting um, the, uh, I think it's, they're calling it the LA edition, um, which is going to have the same baby blue exterior, kind of the same wheels and all that stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a really beautiful, striking thing. So very cool to see that that will actually be hitting the streets as a production car, even if it is, you know, about four years away. And Mazda this week has announced a few changes to the Mazda 3 for the 2023 model year. So, first they get five more horsepower actually for the nationally aspirated 2.5 liter for a total of 191 horsepower now, thanks to some adjustments that they made that also amazingly improved fuel economy too. And so that is thanks to the better cylinder deactivation programming. Um, so it now does two better MPG in the city, one and uh, one better combined, and also two better on the highway. And so it gets 28 MPG city. 37 high whip and 31 combined now, which is re really solid. Again, for a non-turbo, naturally aspirated thing with almost 200 horsepower to be getting almost 40 MPG on the highway, really solid. The turbo motor also um, gets no changes, so that one will be staying the same. Uh, but unfortunately, in the sedan Mazda 3 for 2023, it's only available in the Turbo Premium Plus trim. Um, so the base turbo trim is now gone from the sedan. It is still thankfully going to be offered in the hatchback, um, but now you got to spend like 35 grand or so if you want the turbo in the sedan now. Um, so just one thing to keep in mind there. The hatch also continues to offer the manual though, thankfully, which is great. So I guess. Clearly there were enough manual buyers, thank you manual Mazda 3 buyers, in the first couple of years here to you know justify keeping it around. Um, so they are continuing to offer the manual here in the hatch, which is great news. Um, and then uh, on top of that here, um, the last little thing uh, is the one thing that isn't sticking around is the two liter base engine. So they tried that out for just one model you here last year for the Mazda 3 of offering a base one to kind of bring the uh, entry price down because I think Mazda 3 sales were kind of hurting towards the start there because it was a little bit higher for the price tag to start versus you know the Mazda 3 pricing everyone was used to. So they offered the two liter guess people didn't want to really go for the two liter actually and uh, people just ended up sucking up the higher prices I guess and so they're dropping that two liter here uh, for 2023 so they're all two and a half liters now um, lastly the prices have gone up like everything else totally expected and that's normal even before these crazy times we're living in now I mean prices always usually go up every single year uh, for cars and so most trims are between 450 and 550 dollars more expensive now um, which I think is actually a pretty reasonable increase compared to a lot of other stuff out there currently um, so the premium trim, um, that one does jump up a lot more. That goes up by $1,700 if you want a premium non-turbo Mazda 3 now. But uh, all the other ones, you know, between $450 and $550, including the turbo one. So that's great. There's, you know, just me meager, reasonable you know, improvements there as far as the, uh, you know, actual, you know, fuel economy and stuff. But also as far as the pricing, it's not too bad. Regardless. I still think these are a great value, even at the more expensive pricing. I still think that they are, you know, one of my favorite compact sedans in the segment. And really solid. And so anyway, uh, if you're interested in these new uh, Mazda 3s, the 2023 hatch will be arriving first this fall, and then the sedan will be coming this winter. So cool to see that. And uh, moving on here, an interesting rumor this week. So YouTube channel Automotive Press has translated the latest issue of Japan's Best Car Magazine, um, which has a report claiming that Toyota is planning to do a two-door coupe version of the Crown by 2025 or 2026. Um, and the convertible version is even a possibility after that, maybe a year or two later. Um, so... On the one hand, this isn't totally crazy. You know, Toyota did reveal a whole Crown sub-brand here. Of there's like four different models that the rest of the world is getting. We're only getting, you know, the one Crown lifted sedan, but the rest of the world's getting a couple crossovers and stuff. So on one hand, I see, you know, how they're trying to build out the Crown as the sub-brand. And so adding more models to that sub-brand makes sense. 
Toyota is also awesome enough that I could see them you know, trying to you know push through a coupe even if they knew that you know coupe sales were going to be dismal and it probably doesn't make sense financially. You know they have some real enthusiasts and leadership roles that you know are uh, spearheading a lot of this stuff and so you know. It's certainly possible, probably a little more possible hearing it coming from Toyota than, you know, from another car company, which I mean, everyone else is killing off their coupes left and right. And stay tuned for more of that in a second. But on the other hand, though, the rational side of me says, yeah, no one buys coupes really. So how can they justify this? And on top of just that, how can they justify a crown coupe that is going to be more expensive and be towards the top of the Toyota range? You know, I mean, clearly it would be, you know, front wheel drive based, you know, all wheel drive type thing, most likely and be softer. So it's not really going to encroach on the 86 and the Supra much. But, you know, the problem here is that if they're going to have a coupe with all wheel drive, um, you know, you can also and if it's also I mean, most likely these crowns are going to be around 50 grand or so. Um, you know, if you have a $50,000 Toyota coupe, why not buy a high $40,000 Lexus RC, also available with all-wheel drive, better rear-wheel drive platform? You know, I don't see why you wouldn't just go for an RC for the same kind of money. Unless they plan to push Lexus RC pricing way up, like 15 or 20 grand up, I don't see how there's room for a Crown Coupe unless they make it really cheap and make it like an entry-level crown but it, you know typically the coupes these days are like upmarket fancier things but i could see this you know being like if they make a crown celica or something like that and they make it a front wheel drive cheap thing and offer it alongside the g86 of like hey here's the sports car coupe and here's the you know comfy coupe to kind of fill in the gap for like a honda civic coupe that's gone away you know stuff like that i could potentially see that making sense from a you know marketing standpoint but it just you know when you're talking about fifty thousand dollar coupes just get a lexus you know so I don't know. I mean, we'll see. It's an interesting rumor to kind of kick around and, you know, think about, but, um, you know, just, I think it's, it's an uphill battle for any kind of company to approve any kind of coupe these days, just because of, again, how, you know, f so few people are even buying them anymore. So speaking of which I'm very sad to report that infinity just confirmed to car and driver this week that the Q60 will be ending production at the end of this year. Um, so an infinity spokesperson said we are focusing on the most popular luxury automotive segments, such as crossovers and SUVs, as well as the upcoming EV we recently announced that will be built here in the U S um, and so it's, I just, I think it's a really big shame because I mean, you know, the Q60, I actually really liked it. I reviewed it, you know, back in 2017. Um, I really enjoyed my week with it. It's, you know, fast and powerful with that, you know, Red Sport 400 thing, 400 horsepower. Um, you know, it was very luxurious, super comfortable. Yeah, these days the tech might be a little bit dated, but it was fine. You know, it still had, you know, eight inch screens top and bottom there. It was, you know, a really nice interior. I think just, again, the looks were so good looking. I don't know why it didn't sell better, honestly. Um, but the fact is it just didn't sell. And so that's why, you know, they're getting rid of it. And, uh, it's kind of been a short run too. It's only been around for about five years, which is definitely on the shorter end as far as life cycles go for vehicles. Usually they try and, you know, milk them out a little bit longer before, you know, they get rid of them, but, um, that's it. So, uh, pretty crazy. And, uh, thankfully though, they did confirm the Q50 will last. And so they will have a 2023 model year of that beyond that. It's anyone's guess, um, you know, but at least Q50 is safe for now, but don't assume that it's going to stick around much longer. That's for sure. Um, and Infinity did note that because production will be going till the end of this year, there will be plenty of dealer inventory of Q60s well into 2023, they said. So we still probably got another year of, you know, your window to buy a brand new Q60 if you want. Um, but they're just, I'm, I'm sad to see that one go. I think if they give it a nice little mid-cycle refresh to freshen it up, give it, you know, some better interior components, I think it still could have been very competitive. Um, and it's something that, again, they already put it out there. They already, you know, paid for it. You might as well, you know, keep it going for a few more years, uh, bump out the screens a little bit and, you know, keep it going. But I guess it just doesn't make sense anymore. And so it's a bummer, but uh, it is what it is. But um, sad to see the Q60 go for sure. And um, not a, wanting to add on a, end on a sad note here, though, I want to say the last news story here is a very nice heartwarming story. And that is that a Porsche has made a special one-off 911 that is a modern interpretation of Sally from Cars, the movie, uh, and will be auctioning it off for charity this weekend at Pebble Beach. And so Pixar's creative director said they weren't looking to make a replica of the movie car, but instead answer the question, if Sally Carrera was built today in life-size for the road, what would she look like? So it gets a unique color called Sally Blue Metallic and it has unique 996 inspired wheels that Porsche stressed are only for this car and will not be offered in any 
form, you know, to keep the car special, you know, so you're not going to be able to order these wheels from Porsche or pay a ton of money for Porsche to make more of them. It's only for this car to keep it special again and also to really help, you know, boost the price tag there for charity. So, and it definitely is special being, again, an, a one-off. They're only making one of these and that is it. On top of that, so other stuff here with this vehicle. So the interior features Pepita cloth and has unique blue accents. And one fun touch that I really appreciate is that the sport response button on the wheel has been relabeled as the Kachow mode, which is just fun. And, you know, it just shows they had the passion and went the extra, you know, 110% with this uh, project just you know with those fun little touches it's really really cool you can even see they have uh, sally's tattoo on the back on um, this integrated there into the spoiler and stuff it's just very fun obviously i have a soft spot for movie homages uh you know with vehicles like the bullet and all that kind of stuff but it's just really cool to see you know this thing come to life and uh it's just very very fun so mechanically it's the same as a regular 911 gts um, with 473 horsepower 420 pound feet of torque it has ruble drive and a manual transmission um and the winning bidder also will get a unique watch that was created jointly by porsche and pixar you get a book that documents the car's development and even the molds that were used to finalize the color are included in the sale Plus, there's a second set of wheels for track driving, they say, uh, in case the winner of this extremely rare car wants to risk playing with it on track, which seems unlikely. I'm just guessing it's maybe a backup set of wheels since, again, they will never be made again. You know, if something happens to one of them or it gets curbed or something, you know, at least you've got a backup set. So that's nice that you have that. Um, and so, yeah, it's just really cool to see, you know, Pixar and Porsche coming together, again, for charity, for a great cause, and a really fun special edition. Um, and uh, I'm, we'll be curious to see, you know, how much it actually goes for here this weekend with the auctioning. And, uh, yeah, it'll be very interesting to see that. Lastly, I just want to give a huge thank you to all of you who are members of the Matt Moran Motoring Club. So we did have one new member join this week, so I want to give a huge thanks to Steve R. for joining. I hope you're enjoying the perks so far, Steve. And um, I really, really appreciate the support. So thank you so much for being becoming a member. For anyone else that'd be interested in becoming a member, there should be buttons here on uh, the ch uh, channel page as well as the video page here with a little join button. There's also going to be a link in the description if you want to check it out and uh, join. But anyway, thank you all very much for watching. Huge thanks, especially again to all those members that joined. I also want to thank all of you who also commented on my post this week about uh, suggestions as far as how to improve the views on the channel here. I really appreciate, you know, the like hundreds of comments I got on that. That's very, very much appreciated. It just goes to show, you know, how much you guys really, you know, love and support the channel. And I really, really do appreciate that. And um, so anyway, hope you guys all have a great weekend. Thank you all very much for watching. I'll see you on the next one. Take care.